Ken Burroughs. His wide left. Billy Parks is to the right. Oh, what a hit that was. John Mendenhall. When he puts you down, he really gets it. Built like a low slung Tank. power, and when he comes in low on you, I mean, you're hit. Well, hello. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to check out this video, Adam. Welcome to the Gridiron. And before we get started, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone out there who's been watching my videos. Thank you. If you can maybe give this video a thumbs up, or possibly leave a comment below, or maybe even share this video. It would mean so much to me, but at least anyway, just thank you so much for just taking time out of your day to check out this video. Thank you. Well, you know, the ball's still rolling, right? So we got Adam Peters of the 49ers coming in today. And Ryan Poles from the uh, the Chiefs, he was in for his interview uh, yesterday. All right. Um, what I did, I haven't heard or read anything as far as like, you know, maybe how polls might have done. I mean, it just ju it just happened recently. I mean, obviously yesterday, but I, you know, I didn't hear anything, see anything or specifically maybe how he did. But one thing I did find out is that uh, apparently the um, the Giants, I mean, with, I guess with Tish and Mr. Mara and all, they're kind of given whoever the new GM is, like kind of a carte blanche. Meaning, like, they, if, they, if they see something wrong with the scouting system or department or whatever, you just, you just do whatever you want. <laughs> you know, which is pretty good, pretty special. I mean, it's not like, you know, you, you, know, you beat a GM, you know, uh, you know, you know, you be, be the general manager, make some this and that, but don't, don't go crazy changing things and all. And, and no, that's, apparently that's not the way it's going to be. So, I mean, if, if, if there's things going to be overhauled by the new GM, they're going to be overhauled. So, that's awesome. That's awesome. Which is um, one of the, the biggest complaints was about, you know, uh, maybe not so much Stephen Tish because, you know, he's not really there all the time, hardly ever. He doesn't really ever speak or anything like that. You know, he's, a, he, you know, uh, but Mr. Mara is there all the time. You know, and, uh, the, you know, it's kind of like... The same people doing the same things over and over. It's like having a business out in today's world. If, if, you, yeah, if you're operating your business the same now as you were five years ago, you might be out of business. You know, you, you have to keep, you have to evolve with the times. Things, you know, things catch up to you and they, they, they just pass you by. So if you don't keep changing and roll with the tide and all and everything, you know, <laughs> You got a sad organization, and that's what the Giants have right now. So that, that that might be really, really good, especially if you have somebody coming in from another team who's you know very knowledgeable that you know about, especially how to run a good organization. All and he comes in, he starts looking around, and <laughs> he sees it running like shit. He's going to start changing things. So that is huge. Um, so anyway, uh, polls. All right. Dude's only 36 years old. I mean, can you imagine? Whew, wow. I mean, this is his 13th season, you know, all with the Chiefs. Now, the, uh, some of the other guys, obviously, like, um, I haven't heard anything about, like, maybe as far as maybe anybody else coming in. But, I mean, like, uh, like uh, Joe Hortiz. I'd be surprised maybe why they wouldn't be bringing him in from the Ravens. But Hortiz has been, you know, like, for 24 years. Um uh, Shane, right? He's been around since I think 2000, 2001. Pretty two, two, 2000, he was, um, yeah, 2001. So 2000, he was an intern at the ticket office for the Carolina Panthers. So I'm not really including that. So, but basically, since 2001. So some of the other guys have more, you know, more experience. But uh, you know, he's still he's you know been for 13 years. So he, he's been around the block a little bit. This is his first year, right, Poles? as the Chiefs Executive Director of uh, Player Personnel. Okay? And it's, it's his 13th season with the team. Uh, he also, he oversees all aspects of the scouting of the college players. Right? Uh, he assists in the pro, uh, pro procedures um, and prepares for the free agency. So, so I mean, so yeah, he's involved. He also winds up help, helping out, uh, he assists the, the uh, Chiefs GM 
Brett Veach. Right, so, you know, so he's, you know, he's got, obviously he's got some experience and all, and I tell you what, if you're 36 years old, I mean, <laughs> yeah, and, and they're bringing you in for an interview, I mean, that says, that uh, speaks volumes of you. I mean, even if he doesn't get the Giants job, I mean, if he's, yeah, you're that young, and they're bringing you in, right, you got a bright future ahead of you. So, I mean, if, somebody, if the Giants don't sign him, I'm sure sooner or later somebody else will wind up signing him. Um, now, he, he, he's he got, uh, you know, uh, a, a small, uh, you know, wait, contact with the Giants. Very, very little. I mean, he never coached with them or anything like that, but, uh, you know, he uh, played offensive tackle for Boston College from 2003 to 2007, and he uh, helped protect the Falcons' current quarterback, Matt Ryan, because Matt Ryan was obviously with Boston College back then. Um, now, he overlapped one year. Now, I don't, he didn't probably line up on the same offensive line with him, but he overlapped one year with Chris Snape, who was our second-round pick in the 2004 draft. Now, Chris Snee's last season was 2003 for Boston College because he came out and, you know, and then he you know, got drafted in 2004. That was Ryan Paul's first year was 2003. So they overlapped for one year. But, I mean, so that was Chris Snee's last year. That was Ron Paul's first, uh, Ryan Paul's first year. So I don't know if they actually were on the same offensive line, but they, you know, they were on the same team, uh, you know, for, for 2003. And then you also got, uh, you know, um, he, he was – did overlap, he did play with our 2006 first round pick, Matthias Kiwanuka. We drafted him in the first round of uh, 2006 NFL draft, and he went to Boston College. So, and but he did, he didn't overlap with um, somebody who went to Boston College from 1999 to 2002, which was Brian Flores. They both, so they both went to. Boston College didn't overlap, but, you know, they got the Boston College connection there. You know, uh, Flores' last season was 2002. Ryan Poles' his first season was 2003. So, no overlapping, but, right? And then, of course, not to mention that uh, when Chris Snee got drafted in the second round of the 2004 draft, and then you got um, Matthias Kiwanuka getting drafted in the first round of, of the uh, 2006 NFL draft, he got drafted by da -da, Tom Coughlin, who coached da -da, Boston College from 1991 to 1993. And he did a very good job there, too. Uh, he upset 1993, because my favorite team is Notre Dame. He upset Notre Dame. When it, that was the first time Boston College ever beat Notre Dame. Notre Dame was number one, looking to, looking to, uh, to win a national championship. And uh, they went in Notre Dame. They beat them 41 to 39 on the last second field goal. Huge upset. But that was Tom Coughlin was the coach, and that you know that helped him. That helped him, you know. So I mean, so he so he's got the Boston Ryan Poles got the Boston College connection kind of going on there, uh, you know. So he's very impressive. He's also what I was reading. He was in, uh, the the Vikings were impressed by him as well too. So he you know if the Giants have interest in him, you know. If Adam Peters is the last guy that uh, the Giants are going to bring in, they might want to jump on him. If Adam Peters isn't going to get him, because you've got to talk to Adam Peters, obviously. But if they're interested in Ryan Poles, once they get it done with Adam Peters, if Adam Peters is, is out of the question, they might want to jump on him, because if uh, you know, they don't jump on Ryan Poles, somebody else might. Now, uh, the other thing is you've got to want to figure out is that he has the, the connection, a small connection with Brian Flores, but a lot of people also think with Ryan Poles being at Kansas City that he might wind up bringing over Eric, the enemy, the enemy, the offensive coordinator. Uh, a lot of people were, oh, so I saw some stuff speculating like he might bring Steve Spagnuolo over. I mean, no, nah, not happening. Nah. Uh, he, he, Spags is an awesome, great defensive coordinator. I mean, he's doing phenomenal with the Chiefs. He did Good with the the Giants, but I mean, uh, you know, as a head coach, no, not having a pal, not, not not happening at all. Um, but I mean, Eric, I mean, Eric, yeah, the enemy, 
the offensive coordinator. Now, you know, what he's calling the plays there. It looks like Andy Reid's calling the plays, you know what I mean? And also they got, you know, um, obviously Patrick Mahomes. They got Tyreek Hill. They got Travis Kelsey. So those guys help as well, too. But he's learning under Andy Reid, right? And so he's, he's, he's getting a hell of an education. So if he would wind up coming over here, that would be, that would be, could be huge for our offense because, you know, the education he's getting from being with the Kansas City Chiefs you know, is priceless. Now, the thing is with him, it, you know, the, the thing that kind of worries is that what, if you're getting, like, Joe Shane, say he brings uh, Dable over, right, the offensive coordinator for the Bills, or if uh, we get Poles and say he brings Eric Bieniemy over here. I'm not sure who uh, Peters would wind up bringing over. But, I mean, if you bring well, somebody over who's like an offensive coordinator to be the head coach, well, that's, that's, that's you know, fine and fancy. The, the thing is, is like, cause especially if none of these guys has actually been a head coach before, right? They got to start, now. you know, they got to go from like just maybe calling plays. Now they got to start, you know, <laughs> you know, now they're involved with everything. Are they going to call plays and be the, you know, you know, oversee everything as well. I mean, because like Joe Judge didn't work out very well, but I mean, Joe Judge didn't call plays, didn't call the offense, didn't call the defense, didn't call special teams, nothing. He was there inside, you know, as I said, didn't work out very well. But you're calling timeouts and, you know, we're going to go for it on fourth down or, you know, this, you know, things like that. So, I mean, so when you go from being an offensive coordinator to all of a sudden, and if you're going to be calling the plays and you got to overlook everything, Sometimes that might be a little bit too much, much to handle, especially for a first time. You know, I mean, you know, bring him in and try him out. But, I mean, you know, you know, it might be tough, especially for some people. It just might be a little overwhelming. Now, like, there's a point in hand. Like, you got Tom Coughlin, okay? You know, we won four Super Bowls with two coaches, right? Tom Coughlin, when he was, like, like 2015, his last season, right, he was on the sideline. Right? He was overseeing everything. We had Spags, right, as a defensive coordinator. Um, then we had, uh, oh, who could forget, Ben McAdoo, right, as our offense. He was calling the plays. So Tom Coffin was on the sideline overseeing everything. You know, we're going to call a timeout or, you know, with the situation. We're going to pump. We're going to kick a field goal. We're going to, you know, get the, get the this ready, get that ready. You know, what's going on, you know. He could oversee everything. So instead of instead of you know worrying about what plays to call and where if we're gonna if we're gonna if we're gonna try to uh, you know go for it on fourth down in inches or, or what are we doing here what are we doing you know sometimes it's a little overwhelming. So Tom Coughlin you know was just on the sideline and he had the, had everybody else taking care of business for him, which you know, which was huge. Same thing with Bill Parcells. Bill Parcells he was our head coach from '83 to '90. You know I mean. It does help if you have your defensive coordinator is a uh, Bill Belichick, but from basically from 1985 to 1990, right? He had Ron Earhart, offensive coordinator, and he had Bill Belichick, the defensive coordinator. Bill Parcells is on the sideline overseeing everything. You know, as I said, you know, sit, thinking about situations and this and that. And as I said, we're going to call timeout. We're going to go for it. You know, he can worry about that. Ron Earhart's calling the offensive plays. Bill Belichick's calling the defensive plays, right? So you don't have to worry about that. As I said, from 1985 to 1990, those six years, right, he had Earhart and Belichick doing the dirty work for him. And during those six years, we won two Super Bowls. So, you know, so, I mean, so having these, these great, you know, offensive coordinators coming in, and if all of a sudden they're going to start calling plays and being the head coach, it might, might be a little overwhelming. So... It'd be interesting to see who, who the uh, the new GM wants to bring it in. And then, if, as I said, if they do bring in a coordinator, is the coordinator just going to be the head coach and, and he's going to delegate the, 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 the duties to other people? Or is, it, is the coordinator going to come in and maybe call the defensive plays or kind of come in and call the offensive plays and, and be the head coach as well? So it's going to be very interesting to see <clears throat> what's going to go on, and we'll probably want to find it out within the next week or two anyway. Which brings me to my next point, which is that the Giants asked for a head coach in an interview from the Cowboys defensive coordinator, Dan Quinn. Uh, now, he's been, you know, he, uh, see, yeah, he's been a head coach before. He was a head coach with the uh, Falcons from 2015 to 2020. Um, 
Oh my, that's when they went to the Super Bowl. And uh, 51, I think it was, they lost. They were winning 28 to 3. Oh my God. And they lost to the Patriots <laughs> and Tom Brady. But 2016 and 2017, all right, they went to the playoffs. They had very nice seasons. They, they were very good, you know. Um, the, what was it, 2018 and 2019, there was, I think there was 7 and 9 both years. So, I mean, it was a little. Below expectations, right? Then 2020 rolled around, and he started off 0 and 5, and he wound up getting canned. But uh, you know, but he's been a pretty popular person. Um, you know, after seeing what he's done with the Dallas Cowboys defense this year, he's been a very popular person because he's got interviews not only from the Giants, but apparently from the Bears, the Dolphins, <laughs> the Broncos, the Jaguars, and the Vikings have all sought interviews with him. So, and I even. I even saw something online, yeah, whether it's true or not, is that he, he possibly expected maybe to be the Broncos' next head coach. So we'll wind up saying, but I said, but, he, you know, he's been a head coach before. He's been, you know, he's done, you know, right? He's done, you know, he, he knows how to handle all that stuff, right? Which is, which winds up being huge. Now, he did a great job this year with the Cowboys' defense, all right? But let's not also forget, all right, you know, which is going to lead me to kind of like to my like last point here, right? Um, you know, he did a phenomenal job with their defense, right? But, you know, the Cowboys, their first six draft picks they had this year were all defense. Why? Because their defense was really bad last year, 2020. This year, 2021, you know, the first six picks were all defense. Pick number 12, pick number 44, number 75, 84, 99, and 115. So they had six of the first 115 picks in the draft. So if you figure out of, you know, say 115, what did I say, say 57, so say first 115 picks, say 57 were offense and 57 were defense. So they basically got kind of like, they've all got like six of the best 57 defensive players in the country that they drafted, right? And they took those six and, right? Yeah, and it, yeah, it, it showed um, and, of course, you know, pick number 12, of course, was Micah Parsons. He had, you know, that certainly helps. Now, he had 13 sacks. Dude is unbelievable. <laughs> More sacks than Lawrence Taylor, guys, unfortunately. Now, it's, this would be one thing. We always, it, it's like, would you rather have Micah Parsons or behind door number two, would you rather have <laughs> Kadarius, I'm hurt, Tony, and the Bears' number seven pick? Be interesting to see. Be interested to see what we wind up doing with the pick number seven because because we got Kadarius Tony, that means we got the Bears pick number seven. So uh, be very interesting to see. Hopefully, if pick seven winds up being a, a, a real a real beaut, then we, maybe we got the best of it. But right now, I know I know a lot a lot of us would love to see uh, number eleven, well number eleven, Michael Parsons run around on the field for us. But it is what it is, guys. But um, you yeah. know. But, I mean, you know, you look at what the Cowboys did, all right? They, um, they were from number 23 in yards allowed in 2020, all right? You know, they were not the worst, but there was 23. They went down to number 19 in yards allowed. But they went from number 28 in points allowed down to number 7 in points allowed. They went down from 29.6 points per game. They gave up almost 30 points a game, down to 21.1. They gave up 8.5 points less per game. That's special. That's a heck of a jump. The, the Cowboys in 2020, they only had 23 turnovers. This year, right, they had 35 turnovers. I think they had 26 interceptions, which led the NFL. The Patriots were number two. They had 23 interceptions. So by far, they had the most interceptions in the NFL. So, I mean, 35 turnovers, they, they really did good. Really did good. They had a little more than two turnovers a game, which is really, really good. Then, of course, their sacks in 2020, they only had 31. This year, they went up to 41. So, once again, a lot of that was due to Micah Parsons. But, you know, so he's really, you know, he really helped turn that defense around a lot. But it was him. But however, it was also Micah Parsons and some of the other, their draft picks too. Plus they were they were banged up last year in twenty twenty. They had a little more health this year too. So let's not forget that as well. All right. But which brings me, you know, kinda you know, why he might be like a hot item 
you know, you know, yeah, no, you know, I can, he did a great job, but I said, but it's, was it all him or was it a decent amount, the talent, which brings me to my last and final point here. Go to 1980, New York Giants, right? 1980 Giants uh, were 24th in yards allowed. They gave up 359.5 yards per game. They gave up 5,752 yards. So they were 24th in the league. But that's 24th out of 28 teams. They ain't 32 teams like there are now. There's only 28 teams. So they were 24th out of 28 in yards allowed in 1980. 1981, Bill Parcells is the linebacker coach and the defensive coordinator. And in 1981, of course, we draft the GOAT, Lawrence Taylor. So we go from yards allowed 24th to 3rd, Bill Parcells, but Lawrence Taylor. So we go from 24 to, we got out 21 spots, yards allowed. We gave up 301 yards. We went down basically like 58 yards a game because of Lawrence Taylor. And as I said, Bill Parcells, too. All right. Uh, points allowed. All right. The Giants gave up 26.5 points per game. They gave up 425 points. They were 27th out of 28 teams in 1980 as far as points allowed given up. All right. <laughs> They went from 27th down to 3rd. Bill Parcells, but Lawrence Taylor. Right. They went from 26.5 points per game down to 16. They gave up 10.5 points less per game. Bill Parcells, but Lawrence Taylor. Right. And then you got the sacks. Right? And just, you know, there's, a bunch, there's a bunch of stats, but I just threw the sacks in there. Dude. The sacks, the Giants were 22 out of 28. They had 28 sacks. They were 22nd in the league, right, out of 28 teams. Then they went up, because of Lawrence Taylor, right, and, you know, Bill Parcells, but they went up to 44 sacks. They went they went to 6th in the league, right? So let's keep, you know, you got to keep all of this stuff in mind. You know, as I said, you know, if you're going to bring over a coordinator to call the plays, is he going to is he gonna be able to handle calling the plays and taking care of everything else? I mean, I'm not saying the defensive plays and stuff because you got a defensive coordinator that for that. But I mean, you know, are you going to be able to run the rest of the show and call plays at the same time? And I said, and then as far as Dan Quinn, did a phenomenal job this year, right? But let's not overdo it with you know how well he did because you know let's not forget you know they got an influx of talent, the Cowboys, and they got Michael Parsons. Now let's not you know. Maybe overdo maybe so much what Bill Parcells did in the 1981 season because the Giants got Lawrence Taylor, and when you got when you get talent like that, you know that's one of the reasons why your your defense gets so much better. So, you know, so it's going to be interesting to see. As I said, we're going to take a coordinator and make him a coach, or we're going to get a retread coach and try to bring him in for a second time and hope for hope for the best. So it'll be very 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 exciting. But guys. Right now, we're making history. I mean, we've had Andy Robustelli, George Young, Ernie Acorsi, Jerry Reese, Dave Gettleman. All right, so this, we got we got number six coming up. Who, who's the new GM going to be? So hopefully, uh, hopefully tomorrow, if we don't have anybody else coming in after Adam Peters today, hopefully tomorrow we'll find out who the sixth GM in the history of the New York football giants will be. Well, as always, guys, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to check out this video. You guys stay safe out there and go Giants! Woo!